Hi, and welcome to the Boat Princess podcast. My name is Nikki Vo, and I'm your host. I am a boat owner, a marina's owner, an international conference presenter, and a huge advocate for boating. I'm sharing the stories from every nook of the boating industry with the intention of encouraging more women to join me and for more women to get behind the helm too. I want to share the experiences and opportunities of boating, of the boating industry, and I want you to join me as I bring the conversations and answer all the questions you've had. Boating is not just for the glamorous and rich and famous. It's full of beautiful and interesting people making the most of our natural environment and getting out there enjoying the waterways. So let's let off the lines take over the helm and escape to the world of boating. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Boat Princess podcast. I am super excited because I've got somebody that I just randomly met at Icomia Congress, and it turns out she's friends with one of my friends in Australia, the, the amazing Nick Douglas. Vicky Lowe, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you very much for having me. And I like randomness. It's good. <laughs> it's a great thing, isn't yeah, it? It's brilliant. So you have just um, spoken to the Icomia group, haven't you, about what you do. So you're a director of World Sailing Trust, but you have a real focus that you're zooming in on, aren't you, in, in that space? So tell me what you've just spoken to them about. Um, so I have been here, I kind of feel a bit like a, um, uh, I was going to say like a shroud, but that's not the right word at all. But I kind of felt that it was a little bit maybe out of place. But um, I uh, have been talking to them about the World Sailing Trust and the work that we're doing um, with something called the Carbon Fiber Circular Alliance and the Equipment Recycling Hub. And we've just had a two hour workshop on eco responsibility and sustainability. Um, and there were two other very good presenters um, um, there as well. So I came on third. It's never nice coming on third, is it? Because you sit there and go, oh, no, they've said yeah. everything I wanted to say. Yeah. Um, but it was really good. And I think the exciting thing about being able to talk about these initiatives within this space, with this group of people, is every single one of the presenters all said it's all about collaboration. It's all about working together. It's all about understanding what the wider industry and other industries are doing and learning. And we're not. I think one of the things that we have in our sport, and everybody recognizes this, is that we all work in silos. Um, and uh, today's premise was very much, look, this isn't about working in silos. This is working as a, as a big group because we've got a common problem around equipment, around recycling, around reuse, which are my two favorite words, reuse, repurpose, um, and which ultimately will lead to growing our sport at some, in, at some stage. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about you, but I think... Icomia is an incredible um, situation. I mean, here we are in France and there are literally people from all over the world, from the boating industry here, and they're all talking together, they're all collaborating, they're all saying these are the problems we're going through, what problems are you going through, how can we help each other, what's the... If only the world worked like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I think the key thing is also, um, I think one of the gentlemen in the audience said earlier that it's all very well us talking about it, but we are in huge danger of becoming a bit of an echo chamber. Um, and is that the most important thing is what we do after this. And Ed Slack, who chaired the um, panel, sort of asked us all for a call to action. Um, and then Joe Lynch, who's the CEO of Icomia, sort of said, right, I, if I could ask you one one call to action. Well, I actually had a list um, of <laughs> various ones, so, which I will send him. I yeah. will send him because it would be wrong of me not to. Yeah. Um, in terms of things that a global organization like Icomia, which has um, you know a lot of a lot of networking opportunities and what we can do, as I say, together is far far stronger. Yeah. As I say to we say about everything, don't we? Yes. Absolutely. It's all teamwork. You know, yeah. it's, if we take the sport, any water sport, but if we take the sport of sailing, it's all about in the majority, it's about a team coming together. And But actually outside of on the water, we're not terribly good at that teamwork element. Yeah. And all our problems are the same. So, yeah. 
should address them in mm. that way. Absolutely. I'm very altruistic sometimes, and I kind of think everybody should chit chat and just crack on, but maybe yeah. it doesn't work like that. Yeah, no, no, it does. Um, we do, you're get right. Done. We actually have to, yeah, get things done. Yeah. And um, I believe that's the name of your agency that you do your business. Yeah, I'd like as to say well. when you're yeah, get stuff done, but actually it means get shit done. Yeah. <laughs> And actually, Nikki, Nick, Nick yeah. is uh, Nick is just on the same thing, I think, as well. So yeah. it's there's a there's a good circle there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. So th- that's what you're here for today, mm-hmm. and and obviously we're going to dive into that um, in a bit more depth as we go through the interview. But let's go back a little bit and and understand you, Vicky, <laughs> um, because um, I have to say, peeps, I'm sitting in front of a woman who, who has an incredible vibrance, great energy, and I've literally thrown her in front of this mic and she's actually excited about it. So I, I love that in her character. So, um Vicky, you've been in the industry a very long time, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, tell us, tell us how long ago that was for you. Um, you know, when you start, when you go to boat shows, and after you go to boat shows, after a bit, you sleep, you keep seeing the same people, and you yes. think, oh God, they look old, and you think, oh Jesus, I might look that old as well. But no, you don't, um, by the way. Oh, bless you, thank you. <laughs> I pay you well. Um, uh, so I first started out. Um, I had an agency um, back in the early nineties um, in the marine industry. So we our first our first client, I think, was a company called Wistox, which made aluminium boats Ooh. in. Um, um, in uh, Suffolk. Um, uh, and then through that, we got linked to a journalist, a gentleman called Barry Pickthall, who at the time was the yachting correspondent back in the day when uh, newspapers had paid cor- yachting correspondents of the Times. Oh, those uh, the he intro- yeah, those were the days. <laughs> he introduced us um, or introduced us into uh, Richard Ellis, who was the they were the title sponsor back in the day when um, Olympic teams could be sponsored up until the start of the games. Um, so we worked, I worked on the 92 Olympic Games in Barcelona. So that was my first sort of real foray. Um, we also ran the comms around the British Steel Challenge, which was the first one of those pay, you pay your money and you go around the world on a boat, um, started by a gentleman called Sir Che Blythe. Um, so since then, I've just been very fortunate and I've kind of hopped and skipped from project to project. And I think I've now done 13 round the world races, not personally, yeah. but involved in the comms around them. Um, and my last one, which I suppose in a way has been my most rewarding, although I please forgive me, anybody, any of the other campaigns that I've worked on, was with Team SCA in the 14-15 uh, um uh, Volvo Ocean Race, as it then was, um, which was the all-female team uh, in that. So that was just uh, an amazing three years of, of of my life. But what came out of that was how sailing has the power to inspire, and in particular, women in the sport to inspire teams. And of all of the other campaigns I've done, to see young girls and boys sort of screaming, wanting signatures, and uh, literally sort of hero worshipping uh, the team of of, uh, of women was was just incredible um, so that came that came to an end that project and um, we then immediately set up this organization called the magenta project which still goes to this day which we um, have done another podcast yeah, with which so was I'm, a, I'm very fortunate to be a trustee of the magenta project um, and the work that they're doing particularly in mentoring is is absolutely superb and I think Nick is a mentor yeah, Nick as is well. a mentor yeah um, so that's really cool um, but then my working life sort of I think you get to a point where there are a lot of people out there that are younger than me and media isn't what media has been. I mean, my very first race, embarrassingly, um, you know, you had to type out a press release and you'd send it off. So my very first race um, was with Heine- we were, it was the Heineken Trophy. I was working for Heineken in the Whip Red race um, in 92, 93. And then I sort of morphed on to working with the all-female team. Um, which was then sponsored by Heineken, and to write a press release, we'd type it up in this container which we were working in, and then you'd feed it to send it by fax to BT, and they had a pre-done list of numbers, and it would appear on a teletext monitor and stuff, and that was it, or a telex monitor. Um, so the world has changed not only in the way we produce media, but also in the way it's 
it's consumed. Mm. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I'm I'm a mother of three. I've got three, not young, they're teenagers now. My youngest is 19, my eldest is 23. And just seeing the way they consume and work with media is just, is on a different planet to me. It's completely different, and, isn't um, it? And it's constant too. Yeah. Yeah. I have a really th- funny thing which I say to, I actually saw it online once, say to the kids, they kind of, they take the mickey out of me not being able to do something basic on my phone. I just turn around to them and say, remember, I taught you how to eat with a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> never take the mickey so that was something i picked up the other day on on, on some feed which i thought was really funny <laughs> um so but then i was very fortunate in 2019 um uh andrew pindar approached me um and he uh put some money behind putting together a strategic review of women in sailing and i sort of came out of a world sailing conference and there was this anecdotal thing about oh there aren't enough women in the sport, but we didn't have any data. So um, I authored the strategic review over the course of that year, which we published in December 2019. And, and yeah, I mean, it pointed out what kind of everybody knew, but to make change, you need to have a reference point and you need to have data and you need to be able to substantiate it. Um, and some, we had nine recommendations that came out of that. And I have to say credit to World Sailing and, and work of people like Magenta Project. Um, a lot of those have now been um, activated. We've, they've just started now coaching um, and race officials courses for women, which is just fabulous. So slowly but surely, we're seeing a change. Mm. So I suppose... One of the things that comes with age, you can just be a little bit more angry, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, and have a bit, be a bit, but a bit, hopefully a bit more credible if you are angry. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so yeah, and that that's what sort of kind of brought me into World Sailing Trust, um, which I do uh, part of the time. And then I have a couple of other small clients off the back of that. Okay. So what does World Sailing Trust actually do for the listeners to understand? So World Sailing Trust is the official charity affiliated to World Sailing, which is the governing body of the sport. And World Sailing, I think it's 142 member national authorities. So a bit like Icomia mm-hmm. with the marine industry. And they have, you know, you have your British Marine and you have Finn in France, et cetera. It's exactly the same, but this is more the sport. This is the sporting element. Um, so they run the governance of what is the sport. Um, and in particular, obviously, the Olympic Games in the four-year Olympic cycle um, and all the sort of big global world championships. They also act as um, uh, they have a number of special events that fall within um, their their jurisdiction, if you like, including I think America's Cup is now a special event, various events in foiling week, et cetera. So involved in America's Cup as well? Um, I was... Yeah, I'm personally not involved in it. Yeah. Um, but World Sailing is. But World Sailing Very is much. in some in some way, yeah, shape yeah. or form. So, yeah. um, and so World Sailing Trust is their charity. And we are, I kind of, um, one of my trustees um, turned around a while ago and said, maybe we're like the conscious disruptors. And then somebody else told me they didn't like that phrase. But in terms of to make change, we need information. So we essentially work in two areas, people and planet. And the people um, area is more is 100% really based around research. So we obviously have the strategic review. Um, we've done a participation study on participation in the sport. Um, I'm just putting about to publish the um, a census report that we did on the member national authorities just to understand the demographics. Is it pale, male and stale? Um, if it is, right, what are the things that we need to do and where do we need to put people in? So you don't want your director or all the directors of sailing um, men of a, of a certain age um, and a certain ethnicity um, because to be relevant increasingly, my personal opinion, to be relevant in this world, we have to be able to be seen when you walk out of here, mm. for example. Mm. Um, uh, and, and one questions whether that is the case. It was interesting looking at the room earlier on. Mm. in that regard but um uh so we did that we've i'm currently looking which i'm actually quite excited about we did um uh, a gender design review one of the things that came out of the strategic review was the lack of suitable equipment for women yes and it's not beyond the wit of anyone to know a male and female forms are completely different mm-hmm. um primarily in clothing yeah i know right i know yeah I, I, you know you walk into a a, a clothing store. Um, I, I'm really excited. I've got a sponsor, Quality Marine Clothing, in Australia, and I was so excited. He said, "Good news. Um, you know, this brand is actually doing female shorts and female pants." Yeah. I mean, 
It's 2024. I know. We right? go in and out. And I don't think nobody's really realised that we do go in and out quite no. a bit. We're not all, no. you know, wafer thin and, you know, tall and, and lanky. But so, yeah, slam or something. Yeah. Making something so, 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 we've, um, so we started doing, we, we did a, we did a, a sort of an initial uh, over just under 3,000 respondents. And yet the biggest issue by a country mile was clothing. Yeah. But the most troubling issue um, was safety. Yes. And 76% of women who responded did not feel safe in their life jackets. Now, if you're trying to grow a sport and you're trying to get young women to stay in the sport, you've yeah. got to feel safe, right? Yeah. Um, that was because they just don't fit. Right. So if you're if you're well endowed yes. in the top half, yes. you need to size up. You put your arms up, it's going to fall off. Gotcha. Um, uh, and there are some manufacturers that are looking at that. Or you breathe out too heavily and the flinking thing goes off, you know. Yeah. So um, there are definitely, but equally issues for, for, for smaller, tinier women as well. I mean, I mean, I'm not small by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think I've ever in all of my years in this industry ever had a piece of clothing that fits me. No. Um, properly. Yeah. In that, you know, your shorts are male shorts, which don't go in at the waist. You're, yeah. You're, anyway, we don't need to go into the clothing side because it kind of, it dilutes a little bit the the conversation. I think it's more around safety, um, and we're doing. We've just started doing some really interesting work, um, and we're really hoping to launch this in a in a couple of months with motorsport and the equestrian industry. So and equestrianism. So the three gender equal sports all have similar issues with equipment design. So what we're looking at doing is collaborating as a whole. And seeing what change we can then make and, and do some lobbying. And, you know, in the same way we see with football boots, yep. they've got new football boots now, haven't they, that are meant to help for women that have better support, so that helps with ACL inj injuries. I noticed Nike just doing a massive bit of research on ACL injuries in football. Um, but we kind of forget about what we do. Mm. So, mm. you know, and there are simple... Uh, physiological differences between men and women doesn't mean to say they're stronger or or anything or less strong or any of that, but there are simple physiological. Our arms aren't as long. Yes. Um, you know, we when when you look at how women grind on a pedestal, not all women, but some, um, we power top down rather than vertically. So actually, we need to step up. Yep. Because if the pedestal is for a five foot eight, no. no so five foot ten bloke. Yeah, if you're a five foot six woman. It's a completely different, yeah, size. So yeah. there are some considerations along. So those the equipment lines. is literally discriminating against yeah. women at this point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you took it to the its yeah. absolute ends, yeah, probably yeah. you could say that. But yeah. I think more important than that, it's it's we've and we talked about it earlier on today. We have it's a beautiful sport. Exactly, it's a beautiful yeah. sport, and it all of the boxes it ticks in terms of health well-being mental health everything yeah. being outside teamwork. being in touch team all of those things yeah. um but we've got to make it accessible to all yes um and if at the very simplest level you don't feel safe you're not going to do it no so why are girls at the age of 15 dropping out of sailing like nobody's business and that really does happen, doesn't it? Oh, 100%. Yeah, but yeah. it's because, so, so you know, if it's the time of the month, over a period, what, what are they going to do? They're on the water for four or five hours. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's those, it's those little simple things, that, not that equipment can help that, but a better understanding of removing that bias, that sort of almost unconscious bias right at the very beginning. Yes, so many things. Oh, My mind's so going many things. I can see. Yeah, I can see the cogs whirring in your yeah. head right now. <laughs> yeah, smoke starting coming out from everybody. <laughs> but it 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 is the simplest of things that we need to actually knuckle down to and and sort out, and isn't it? And and I know you, you didn't want to delve into the clothing, but that is a really simple thing. If you're if you're out sailing and you're in gear that is uncomfortable and you can't move in, because I mean, look at the sail GP girls; they just run across that boat. And um, if they're not comfortable for that whole time that they're out there and they're out there, like you say, for hours, mm. 
um, you could, you just can't achieve what you want to achieve mm. as well. So, mm. yeah, it's 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 a it's a really interesting um, space, and some, I'm so glad somebody's actually sort of delving into it. And well, I think I think the key thing for us is, or uh, the key thing with any of this is that we can again we talk about echo chambers as we did earlier on, didn't we? Yeah. Um, and the key thing is actually getting the manufacturers involved in the discussion yes. and um, definitely on the clothing side we're fortunate world sailing has musto as a partner um uh, so we've already sort of had an initial so it'd be really interesting to take this to the next level like yeah. let's have that discussion with you let's look at what we can do but again from from our side or from my view on that is that it mustn't just be one clothing manufacturer yes no we you, need to get across you need the board. to have all of them yeah you know going back to the conversation we were having earlier on this morning on eco res, uh, uh, responsibility we held um at Mets trade last year the trust ran a round table on equipment recycling but we had three different manufacturers there across the from the marine industry uh, you know it was a it was absolutely fascinating but we have to it has to be Com, uh, cross commercial, if you like. Yes, absolutely. and the issue, to be frank, with clothing um, probably is that is it commercially viable? Yeah, yeah. But it's this is chicken and egg. It is chicken we and egg. We know that there are women. We out know there. there are women out there, but they haven't got the kit. So yes. somebody has got to take a punt somewhere yes. along the line, and it's exactly just right. I don't know. I'm yeah. very altruistic in this sort of thing, but I think you kind of got to. Be, what's that? <laughs> used to send it to my 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 kids sort of you know, aim for the moon and you'll fall amongst the stars that's it, or that's whatever it. but rising tide lifts all boats all that's that it. <laughs> yep, yep. but uh but i think it's um i mean you know if some if a clothing brand came to me as the boat princess and said let's do a collaboration let's put some clothing together i'd be over the moon because even in the motor yacht space there is there's not a particular space we can go to for some um really nice clothing to to wear when you're out in a boat um you know everybody has to to go through the boutiques and and find unfortunately they always pick blue and white stripes they don't get that but but you know it's it's um it's a real space that is lacking obviously in the technical space for sailing but right across the board the number of times i've gone out on a super yacht for example and one of the ladies has turned up in a completely inappropriate outfit because it doesn't matter how slow or how big a boat is, there's always a breeze. Yeah. So if you're in a short frilly dress, it's not going to be good. It's not going to work. No. So, unless you, unless that's what, that, unless that's the look you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so the uh, there's a big education piece that, that I try to obviously lean into every now and then, but I'd love to lean it into it more. So, if there is a clothing brand out there that wants to collaborate with me and do this, let's talk. So, okay, you've got this space that you're talking about with recycling and Mets Trade is a brilliant space yeah. to bring that sort of talk yeah. together, isn't it? Because it's it's such a great B2B um, situation, Mets Trade. Um, for those of you that don't know, Mets Trade occurs in November time yeah. in Amsterdam at the Rye. Um, the organising committee are absolutely fantastic. Niels and his team do a great job with that show. Um, so tell me... Um, Let's focus in, in on that space. What are you doing in that space in particular? Well, interesting you should ask that. Oh, because I'm actually going to meet Patricia just after this. So I'm going to put this on camera, on camera, and I'm not on camera, on on, uh, on voice. That uh, Yeah, so uh, last year we did, as I mentioned before, this round table, which was really cool. We took, um, we also had a stand, an equipment recycling hub stand, where we took the material that we'd collected at um, a world championship event um, in Schäveningen. My Dutch That's accent. great. Well, you well like done. That? Do you like that? <laughs> Schäveningen. Um, I've probably said it wrong. Um, and we took material we collected from the boat park. So we asked all competitors, we had an equipment recycling hub there, and we asked competitors that if they had any end of life or, or um, uh, sort of trash, if you like, based around rope, sails, clothing, uh, composites and blocks and bits to put them in these particular bins. And then we took the whole lot to Mets Trade, just sort of scattered them. Uh, well, in fact, um, the, the Mets Trade team did a fantastic job um, doing the stand. But the important thing for that was we then had this discussion um, with, um, there were nine in the workshop and 
we went on for about three and a half hours. I thought I'd never keep them in the room that long. Yeah. Um, but Rye was very good at producing this fantastic banana cake, which basically kept them going. <laughs> um, and it was just brilliant. And we came out of that with sort of nine considerations and six sort of recommendations, which again is all based around, you know, what kind of the sort of thing we've been talking about really. Better collaboration, better communication pilots, sharing of intelligence, sharing of information. Let's be more collaborative overall in the approach. Um, and because only by doing that are we actually going to make change because otherwise it becomes silos. I was talking earlier on, you know, we've got a fantastic sport, but it's a bit cottage industry really. Yes. And, the money, and the, especially on the, the, I mean, it's probably, it's probably you know, you've got the people who are the massive great big organizations and then you've got loads of smaller organizations. Um, who are doing some amazing things, but you only kind of know about it in that particular country. So France, we heard earlier on from Guillaume Arnaud from Finn. I mean, France is doing some amazing work, but they are so much more ahead of the UK and probably uh, most other countries in terms of their legislation and the government, yes. or the, sorry, the legislation that means they have to do it. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I think there's some really interesting things that can come out. So I'm excited about this Mets trade um, and still defining exactly what that will look like, but definitely focusing on equipment recycling. I mentioned earlier on I'm trying to encourage at least one manufacturer to get involved in, it's quite funny, it's called an RIP, Returns Incentive Programme. <laughs> RIP, which sounds quite <laughs> death-like, doesn't it? I actually put that, that as a I? heading on an email. I went, oh, no, no it sounds like some, my cat's just died or something. No, I better not put that. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I'd really, I'd, if we can get a manufacturer to prove that you can do recycling, because all of the onus seems to be on the community and the yes. consumer and the, the end user rather than way back at the beginning of the food chain. Absolutely. And I think that flipping... Um, and I, I do think generally, ethically, we are changing as consumers. I don't yeah. know whether you've, I've changed as a consumer. Absolutely. Absolutely. It takes Absolutely. me twice as long to go around the supermarket because I've got yeah. to put my glasses on to read the, where it's come from. No, I'm not going to buy my blueberries from Chile because yes. I know that, okay, if I wait another couple of months, I'll be in a farm down the road kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I think as, as, uh, as a community, as individuals, we are becoming more ethical, um, somebody asked the question earlier on about how can you reconcile recycled or repurp or reused with innovation and technology? Because in sport, we always want the very best, don't we? On the latest bike, the latest tennis racket, the latest kit for your boat. Yeah. How do you? Uh, and my answer to that was just because it's recycled doesn't mean it's not in innovative or using new technology. There's some amazing work being done by people uh, within our industry yeah. um, with sort of bio, whatever it is, and natural fibers, just some incredible work being done. Um, and I, I suppose it's a bit like overall in, in recycling is you kind of, you know, somebody says recycle, you kind of think some dodgy knitted jumper and a, yeah. you know, jog, Actually, this mustn't say that about geography teachers, but you know what I mean, sort of in a corduroy jacket and all looking a little bit Tweed sort of hairy. And, yeah, elbows. yeah. Um, but actually it's not. It's no. really cool. There's some amazing stuff happening. Yeah. Really well, is. I've I've met with a fabulous lady, Hannah, um, a few weeks ago. She makes um bags out of she's a trimmer on boats, um, and she's uh heavily involved with her local sailing community as well. So she uses uh secondhand sails from boats. And all the leftovers from her trimming, so the canvases she's used on covers, the um, the cushion fabric she's used on seats, so on and so forth. She uses, she literally keeps all the little scraps, and she makes these incredible bags, um, which are obviously very nautical orientated. People have probably seen them on my Instagram posts because they're fabulous things, um, and it, it's a brilliant idea mm. because they're they're. You know, it's a sail. I mean, she literally puts even the details of the boat that the sail has come from yeah. inside the bag, so that people know that it's it has come genuinely come from a from yeah. a boat that's already used it. Mm. Um, so yeah, just um, just little things like that. If we can get big versions of that happening, um, yeah, she's Sydney sail bags, by the way. If I didn't say, but she, um, and I know Princess yachts do some really good innovative stuff with their recycling of their, and I think they use. 
I think they put the the when they do the cut up off of, of the timber, they use that in a gen, um, what do you call it when they burn it to make their oh, energy the incinerator. Yeah, thing. so they yeah. put it in the incinerator yeah. to make make energy for mm. their factory. So I think. You know, I think there's actually quite a bit going on in the industry, but we're not necessarily hearing yeah. about all of it as well. Yeah. And I think that's something else that we need to really encourage boat builders especially to really start talking about what you're doing yeah. because then that makes a difference between somebody buying your boat versus somebody else's boat because you're actually making an effort to make a change. Yeah. And also it's what other people can learn from that mm. and, you know, that somebody's uh, it all becomes a bit commercial, doesn't it? it that, and that that's kind of part of the problem. The um, the work that we've done with the Carbon Fibre Circular Alliance, where we have four international federations, so the federations of um, sailing, world sailing, obviously, um, tennis, cycling, and the biath- and biathlon union. And then we have four manufacturers aligned to each of those sports. Um, but what's really interesting, if you look, for example, at the cycling industry, the cycling industry is incredibly collaborative across their commercial organizations. So, you know, there are, I don't know how many bike manufacturers, not a huge number, but there are a considerable number of bike manufacturers. Um, but yet their, their sustainability leads all collaborate or at least talk to each other. Mm. Um, so it doesn't become, I'm being really clever and I'm doing this, I'm going to keep it really secret. And I'm not going to tell you about it, um, but I'm going to tell the wider audience, you know, my, my, the public, if you like, um, because it's my commercial what do you call it? My, the, you know, my, my commer- the thing that's going to make me win commercially, as it yes. were. Yeah. Um, and again, maybe again, that is being altruistic, and that's probably why I haven't made my millions. But you know, that I just think we need to talk more about what we're doing and have organisations like Icomia, like World Sailing, like all of the the big governing bodies or the governing federations to sort of bring all of that together in one discussion, um, rather than all of these silos. Yes just we're not going to get anywhere fast we've got some i mean there's some amazing ideas um but the problem is they need money yes and some of this stuff isn't going to attract money yeah so it's how do you make somebody want to attract money well i think it's going to be a necessity you know it's it's mm. good Le- legislation is going to mm. make people do certain things as well but um but i think as consumers we're going to start saying where does, this, where does this come from? Why? Yeah. How, how far has it been transported? So on yeah. and so forth. So that that we can um, in ourselves make a difference. And once the consumer starts to drive that, that's when the manufacturers, the companies, exactly. the services have to respond to that. Yeah. So it's up. It's kind of up to us as consumers mm-hmm. to start asking those questions and Definitely. start saying. Well, I'm not sure about that. Why? Why have you made it like that rather than making it like that? Mm. And us as consumers making a, a different decision, maybe not buying the new boat, might buying a second hand boat, and then going to Sea Tag and saying refurb it for me. Yeah, you know. So you do it with cars. Exactly. Exactly. We do it with cars. So. Yeah. So yeah. so you know, there, there's different ways that we can do it, and different ways we can we can drive that in ourselves mm. as well, which is an important thing too. And I think the other, I mean, it's kind of not associated, in fact, it's not at all associated, but in terms of silos and how we need to collaborate better, I was, a lot of the work that I've um, been doing, and I have to say I really enjoyed outside of this stuff that we've been talking about today is around sort of greater gender inclu- or inclusion. It's not, just, it's not just gender, it's across the board, so greater inclusion in the sport. And I just wanted to touch on, and you can drop this if you think, but I just wanted to touch on safeguarding because yeah. that's another passionate thing of mine at the moment in that if you are going to have an inclusive sport you need to have a safe sport yes and um having a safe sport in what is a very male sport is a bit tricky has been tricky has been you know and and as a slightly older person in the in in the marine industry i'm probably complicit in it because you kind of knock aside stuff but i think safeguarding is a huge important step that we need to do as a community um, to make sure that those young girls, that not only does their life jacket not fit them or they're not wearing the clothing or, you know, it's time of the month and there's nowhere they can go. There's not even a loo yeah. that they can, with a lockable stool door and a bin that they can go and use, that also it's a safe place, is a safe sport for them to take part in. And we mustn't lose sight of that as well because it's that going back to the sort of the bit that's um, 
uh, con- commercial, that's not commercial, but that is just good human decency um, is what we would expect in every walk of our life. And it doesn't change as soon as you walk in through the door of your yacht club or you go to your event. Um, <clears throat> and that's something that personally, I'm, I'm kind of a bit on a mission to do that yeah, or to so try and do what I can in that space anyway. So give us a couple of things that pe- people can, can do in their spaces to assist with that. Okay. So I think if you, if you go on to World Sailing Trust, www.worldsailingtrust.org, um, there's a resources section and in there is quite, well, I think it's quite a useful thing, keeping the bias out the start line, yeah. um, which is meant to be as a guide to events and yacht clubs to, um, uh, just, to just simple things at which when you actually look at it on the face of it are really simple. Please don't put the women's loo right at the end of the car park because there aren't any facilities. Please, can we have more than one stall? A mirror, not because we're vain, but because we're women, a bin. And it's simple little things like that that um, make the sport more or or help make the event, the venue more inclusive. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, it's just the little, to be honest, it's just, it's not, none of it is, is, um, it's is, not rocket is, science. It's is not it? rocket science. No. You know, and if if you've got feeding mothers, then can they please have a space just to sit quietly and feed their child? Mm. Um, so so yeah, I think there's a lot we can do, sort of in that whole better inclusivity and better safeguarding space. Um, but going back to what we were saying earlier on, a lot of it is a cultural shift as much as, and it encompasses everything. Mm. Um, so I mustn't get angry. No. <laughs> No, and I think that I think that is is one thing we need to um, also be careful that we don't get angry as such. Absolutely, because right. we actually need the men to help us. Allies are the make, most important. Yeah, we need we them need. to help us make mm. the difference. So we don't want to reject them, and we recognise what they've done in the past. But we need their help to to back us to uh, t- change things. To um, because that you know without them, you know. It, we, we we need them. Yeah, yeah. we've got. There are yeah. some incredible advocates, male advocates, and yes. allies in women's sport generally. You know, yeah. just I mean, you can reel them off from Andy Murray at the top, who has to be the best supporter. Um, and within our sport, within sailing, there are some amazing advocates and some incredible projects. And you know what we've now got happening with the America's Cup um, and Sail GP and all other leading events. You know, hey, look, we've got an Olympic Games coming up in a couple of months, and it's equal men and women on the water. So, yeah. uh, not at all is is you know we've got leading events leading by example, but there's a whole pathway. Yes. To lead to that problem, uh, yeah. to lead to that point, yeah. I went to a um, magenta project, ran an amazing, well, I thought it was amazing, foiling clinic in um, Portland, in Weymouth, a couple yeah. of weeks weekends ago, and I was um, privileged enough to go and speak on the Saturday evening. And I looked around at this room, and there were probably twenty young girls from thirteen, fourteen to their early twenties. There were a couple of older ones as well um, who had just been foiling for the first time. Yeah. And they were just blown away. They were there for two days. This, they'd done one day on the water. They were coming back the second day. They were just blown away. Yeah. But the interesting discussions I had with the fathers, there were about four fathers there who came up and said, how can my daughter continue foiling? Yeah. Because she's just been. So you've got, you've got this amazing talent sitting there yeah. on a Actually, it was a beautiful evening. I was going to try and paint a picture of a wet, <laughs> rainy Saturday night, but it wasn't. It was a really nice <laughs> evening. Anyway, pretend it was a wet, rainy Saturday <laughs> night. Um, who just had the biggest blast yeah. and they were going to have another blast the next day. But the only way they could get into it, what what were the steps they could do? So try and find a secondhand boat. There aren't that many. Or try and find 15 or grand and get a, uh, these were, we, they were doing it in wasps. But then you've got a lot of classes of boat like that that yeah. are, trying to encourage more women and just make it and it's very equitable yes so i think again those seeing the seeing these young girls thinking right we need to find that pathway to yes. the that america's cup spot or that um uh, sell gp spot whatever yeah. it is because at the end of the day there's only a few of them well that's right there's at the only, top end yeah, yeah whereas, there's only one on each boat in yeah. sell gp isn't there so correct yeah whereas you know with there I had a, there was a room of 20 girls and say, I don't know, say 50, 50% and still that's 10 girls mm. who really wanted to continue on in the, in, in, in that discipline. Yeah. And I think also we need to really showcase the women that are there, 
Mm. Um, because Nina Curtis, perfect example, yeah. incredible sailor, doing sail GP, got the babe, you know, not long ago, uh, actually just turned one. Oh, Isn't that gorgeous? Um, but she is a perfect example showing women that, you know, it can be done. But, you know, part of that is her partner supporting her in what she's doing. Um, so he's contributing to that as well. And we almost need to tell that story too. You 100%. Know? So, mm. so it's, it's um, I think it's, it's, it's really important that we showcase as many women as we possibly can, which is why we do this podcast. Mm. It's why we're, we're trying to show that women are out there, women are doing their thing and it's a, it's a fantastic place to be. Oh, definitely, 100%. You know, yeah. and, I, and I think um, having worked when my kids were little um, all, the, all the time in sailing, um, I think, um, it, yeah, you're absolutely right. You, I, I'm not a massive advocate of you can have it all because I don't think you can. Yeah. Um, something's always going to, it's always. Give, yeah, no, you can have it all, but in, ba- in, yeah, in stages, give and take, can't yeah, you? Exactly. You know? It gets exactly. messy at this bit and yeah. then it gets um, evened out of that bit. But I tell you what, you become a bloody good, um, uh, what's it called, multitasker. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Very good multitasker. And as yeah. you say, there are some amazing women, you know, got Lisa Ross um, uh, from from Canada, who's just, she's just been at the um, last chance to gather as a coach. She's got a young baby. You've got um, uh, Clarice Kremer, who's just done a, her transatlantic. Um, Lisa's got Blair. a young baby. At least, exactly. There are just, oh. you know, Mary Baumaster, who's an amazing Olympian. So you've got some amazing examples. And there are older mothers, you know, Carolyn Brower, for goodness sake. Yeah. You know, she's, and, and Sam Davies, and all of these other amazing women who are incredible athletes. Yeah. And mothers and have gone through everything. And, you know, going back to my room in that grey, miserable day, which wasn't at all in, uh, in Portland, um, you know, you're looking at those. And one of the questions one of the girls had um, was uh, there was the, one of the women there who was speaking was Josie Glidden. And she asked, well, how, how can you have a full time career and, and do this? Yes. You know, and, and, and Josie was fairly brutal with her answer, but it's. It's not what you shouldn't expect. Yeah. I think I might have gone a bit off tangent there. But anyway, it's not what you shouldn't expect. Is yeah. What I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. <gasps> interesting times, right? Oh, such interesting times. Interesting times. Yeah, and great to be part of that change, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. So, Vicky, how people? How can people find you? How can people get in touch with you? Um, well, through either the fun, fun, sunny old LinkedIn um, which seems to be the new calling card. I've been asked my card twice today and I don't have any anymore. In fact, somebody, uh, I got a phone call about a month, not a phone call, an email about a month ago from somebody I gave a business card to yeah. in 1991 oh. and she still had it. That's amazing. Well, it's amazing. I'm still alive, I suppose. <laughs> Is the other way. But um, uh, so, yeah, through that, through worldsailingtrust.org, um, there's a generic email address or just yeah, connect with me direct um, on LinkedIn. And really happy to. Con- and I think with this conversation um, generally around all of the various, t- many, we've actually covered quite a lot, haven't we? We have. We have. Quite it's a amazing lot. how much, yeah. how much you get yeah. done in 41 minutes on a podcast. <laughs> how long it's been? Yeah. Oh my God. Isn't it exciting? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry if I rambled. No, um, you didn't but, at all, um, but that's, that's but, why it's been so interesting. It's been lovely. <laughs> but I think there are so many different areas that so many different people are, are working in. But actually, if we all know what other people are doing, yeah. we can work better together. And until we work, let's, it's teamwork. Sailing's all, all about teamwork. Rising tide lifts all boats. There you are. So on that, uh, a bombshell, as um, they would say in Top Gear. Um, <laughs> we'll leave you with um, uh, that a great deal to think about. So to all of the clothing companies out there, to all of the safety gear companies out there, to all of the sailors out there, um, stick with it, girls, the young girls especially. Um, get that support and, and uh, keep going because it is an incredible sport. It's an incredible way to live your life and travel and and you would have seen that in your life, Vicky. And I think we're going to have to do another interview another day so we can explore that even further. <laughs> Maybe not. I won't tell tales out of school. I think that's <laughs> oh, what stays on sailing yeah, tour stays. Exactly. Stay. Yeah. What goes on sailing tour stays on sailing tour. Correct. I get it. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> this has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. I like last minute surprises. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. So thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I certainly did. And I am, yeah, I'm going to nail up for a second podcast at some point because that was very enjoyable. Um, you guys take care and we will see you on the water soon. Exciting stuff is happening at the Boat Princess podcast, everyone. And one of those things is a new exclusive content podcast that will be released to those that subscribe. Now, we'll be interviewing people that don't normally go on public interviews, and this won't be a public interview. They'll be hidden behind in our exclusive, amazing content. And then there will also be things like product releases before they're released, all sorts of exciting stuff. So watch this space. Looking forward to bringing it to you. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Boat Princess podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you'd like to know more about what I do and where I am, then you can follow me on Instagram at The Boat Princess. You can also sign up to my newsletter on my website, which is theboatprincess.com. Take care of yourselves, everyone, and hopefully we'll see you on the water soon. Thank you.